So, how can Europe and Africa work together to promote renewable energy and counter climate change? As both the EU and Africa seek a transition to more sustainable energy sources, how can both continents work together towards climate resilient energy security that supports development and reduces dependency on imports? What sort of cooperation would lead to a just and sustainable transition? This debate brings together citizens and experts from both continents to discuss the future of EU Africa energy cooperation. My name is Tanda. I am the Citizen Engagement Manager at the Africa Europe Foundation. Today, I'm joined by Nancy Sage, the European Investment Bank's Chief Climate Change Expert. I'm also joined by three citizens, Amir from Nigeria, Eleni from Greece, and Arjuns from Latvia. To kick things off, I am going to come to you, Amir. I want to talk, I want to ask you about the consequences of energy shortages and power cuts in the lives of Nigerians, especially in terms of employment and entrepreneurship. And of course, we have Nancy here today with an opportunity to ask her directly about the solutions that are available. Please go ahead, Amir. Okay, um, I would say in Nigeria, like um we we are currently um, having very low power supply because I I from where I actually stay and um, do my business like um we a lot of times we don't see power supply up to like um five hours a day like presently it's four hours that's the highest we've seen so um, power supply a day and it's actually affecting um my business and a lot of things. Because mm -hmm. a country, a country that can't um, give its citizens 20, 24 hours. Okay, let me not even um say twenty four hours. Let me say um eighteen hours power supply. It's actually very bad. And um, when you don't even have power supply, other things are definitely not going to move because you have to um spend a lot of money on um fuel to to power your business and uh, every other thing. Nancy, let's talk about the cost of energy shortages on African economies such as Nigeria. Um, there's such a strong link between the lack of power and socioeconomic issues as Amir picked it slightly there. What can we do? How can renewables be deployed to improve the situation he's just described? Well, I think when we think about uh, challenges in countries that don't have enough power, you know, there's different solutions that are needed at different scales. So, you know, we often hear about, you know, if you can provide um, some renewable energy solu solution in remote villages, they don't have to be connected to the grid, but children can, you know, have lighting, they can study after school and so on. But that doesn't help the businesses the, the, that we just heard from Ahmed, you know, who are trying to run a business. Um, they are connected to the grid, but the power supply is is uh, is is just not there during a large amount of the day, and also presumably quite unpredictably. So it's not even as if you can plan your business around around that. Um, and I think that when we think about public sector, um, you know, there's as countries develop, there's certain uh, critical infrastructure that they need to be working you know you need hospitals and and schools and universities and um, government and and uh, your public transport to all be able to work and you know not work you know for five hours a day but to work 24 hours a day and so you need different solutions for those different things and they cost different amounts and they're not um they may not provide everything everywhere but i think we need to think about that we say so we need national grid um, solutions, including um, more interconnections and so on. But we also need probably city grid solutions for particularly critical infrastructure like hospitals or perhaps uh, public transport. And then we need to think about the remoter parts of the countries, which realistically are not going to be connected to the grid for quite a long time. But that doesn't mean there's nothing that can be done. There's actually a lot that can be done. And we, we financed, for example, um, quite an interesting mobile telephone network system, which was very much designed to be low carbon and powered by renewable energy. So it's not just the power into the grid, it's also can you come up with renewable energy solutions for uh, other other services. Um, now, obviously, that's, that requires investment, but it requires investments in quite a lot of things. Um, 
but at the end of the day, if you, if you, you know, so you need obviously networks, you need renewable energy sources, you need storage for particularly if we're talking about the 24 hours, you need storage solutions for nighttime when the solar panels are not working. Um, you, so, so whether those are batteries in houses or larger scale storage in the grid. Um, and, and all of those things are kind of need to go on parallel tracks at the same time. So we, we can't wait for example, until we've sort of connected the whole country to the grid to, to put renewable energy. We have to be doing this all in parallel. But I think it's clear that both in the urban and the rural communities, um, there's a huge cost of not having those uh, reliable, I think reliable is a really important word, low cost access to, to energy, which of course, in order to solve the climate problem, we, we need to come from low carbon renewable sources. Thank you so much, Nancy. And of course, the energy woes are not just in Africa. Eleni, you, you've been a part of our focus group sessions and you've spoken very um, eloquently about the, the struggle. And I know you have thoughts about the sector or, or rather the parties that should be involved in the solution. Should we be looking to governments or, or the private sector? What are your thoughts here, Eleni? Yeah, so uh, first of all, in regards to the SDG 7, like from the UN about transitioning to uh, green energy or renewable energy. Uh, in general, I think the main issue is that this is not at all legally binding. And in some aspects, it's even a little bit greenwashing as in embellishing a little bit the, the, the situation, I feel. Um, I can bring the experience from two countries. First of all, I, I'm Greek, so I can bring the Greek experience, but also there's a, some situations even in the Netherlands where it's my host country where I live. Uh, firstly, about Greece, the current government is quite uh, right oriented, which means that they practically auctioned off the public energy company, they, um, and while they were, they, they said like at their election campaign that uh, this would not at all affect the quality of electricity, they would completely transition to 100% renewable energy, we saw that actually they just returned to coal just a year in the yeah, so this was uh, practically a very disappointing outcome, of course. And uh, then in the Netherlands, it's, I feel, even more covert, like the campaigning of the government and how they deal with that. Um, first of all, they lowered the speed limit from 130 to 100 in an attempt to lower emissions overall. And it's also very interesting, like how now the, the elections, I don't know if you followed recently, like the whole rise of the um, farmer party in the Netherlands, is also due to the inefficiency of the Dutch government to face the goals set by themselves. Like they would break their own laws if they didn't do something about the immense emissions. They've had a great production, great export year, but this also has, you know, um, uh, results in the emission of the, <laughs> of the country. So that is also I think adding a bit to the organized hypocrisy going on in Europe at the moment on how they pledge a more green future while at the same time trying to cut corners from places where you can't really cut corners or the opposite. And that only makes me feel a bit more uh, to what extent is our future really in the hands of CEOs or governments, which would be more of a solution to the problem rather than a simple patch. And Really, it's it's mostly, I, I feel like, for example, there was a nice example about the CF, CFC ban of uh, this uh, component that reduced carbon emissions globally to a large extent. And this was done by governments. So there is experience and evidence to show us that government solutions actually bear better results than, you know, current solutions from companies and uh, enterprises. So my point is, I think everything should be more like multilateral or at least government driven. Yeah, that's all. Lots said there. Do you have a question for Nancy related to, to all these, these layers? I mean, I think I have too many questions to ask. <laughs> <in this. laughs> Let's try one. Let's go with one for now. Yeah, OK. I mean, I, I guess uh, whether the net zero thing you think is actually a tangible um, <laughs> or because in my head so far as I have read or seen in the news net zero is just you know embellishments of a situation so i don't know to what extent it's realistic 
Um, well, I think depends on the net zero commitments. You know, you can have net zero commitments, which are, to use Greta's words, net zero, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you can have net zero commitments, which are quite detailed and quite robust. The critical thing with any net zero commitment is not the end date of the net zero, right? It's the interim. It's the 2025, 2030, 2035 targets, because as I'm sure you are all well aware, as you've all learned about climate change, you know, from when you were young in school, um, it's the path we take that matters rather than the exact end date of the net zero, right? Um, so uh, obviously the path has to be dropping fast. And then obviously you have a tail out as different industries and different countries grapple with the sort of remaining issues that they need to deal with to get to net zero. But we know that energy, for example, globally has to get to net zero by 2040. But the critical thing there is, is not that. The critical thing is what has to happen in the energy net network by 2030, which is not called the critical decade for nothing. And I was in an amazing meeting uh, this week, actually, at the Royal Society in London. It was a big privilege for me. So can I tell you something exciting? I was sitting next to the chair of the IPCC. <laughs> Sorry, just thought I'd tell you that. I was very excited. Um, but we had uh, several professors telling us about tipping points and how close we're getting to some of the tipping points. Um, and the critical decade is all about that. It's all about avoiding tipping points. So we're trying to work out how to deliver SDG 7 while avoiding tipping points in the climate, right? And I'm not sure that all politicians um, who are making some of these policy decisions actually understand that. I am absolutely sure that all the CEOs of fossil fuel companies understand that very well because they have fantastic scientists. The question is then, when you look at any entity, whether it's public or private, what is their 2025? What is their 2030, 2035 commitment? Is it adequate? Is it robust, robust enough for this you know, dramatic fall that we need to make? And how can you, as the public, um, know whether they're delivering on what they said? So, what, what, so there's two aspects, really. Having the targets, and then how public is it and how is it going to be monitored and reported against so that shareholders and stakeholders can actually ask questions and check. So I wouldn't like to say all net zero commitments are blah, 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 far from it, um, but they need those important points. And one other thing I would add, I suppose, is, well, perhaps there are two, is to my mind, knowing what we know now about the global system and the dangers we're facing, those net zero commitments, even though, of course, they're written about greenhouse gas, need to also be addressing the biodiversity and nature crisis and adaptation, because there's not much point in Africa or in Greece building renewable energy systems if they're not resilient to climate change impacts, because they won't be delivering any energy to anybody. So, um, and at the same time, we also can't be further undermining the incredibly fragile biodiversity situation, which we've already made quite catastrophic. So, and I think that's starting to happen. If you if you look at the net zero alliances, banking, uh, the asset owners, uh, etc., they are starting to bring resilience in. And obviously, we had uh, was it this week or last week the first announcement from TNFD. I don't know whether you know what TNFD is, but there was a big thing about TCFD, which, which was about companies reporting on climate information, climate risks, and how they're addressing them. And that started a few years ago. And it created a real change in the thinking of big corporates and big financial institutions that they actually needed to look at transition and physical and legal risk from climate. But now we have TNFD, which is the Task Force for Nature-Related financial disclosures. And they're starting to bring forward, they've just published their proposals for metrics that companies should be using to look at their nature related risks. So another thing, of course, that you or other shareholders can do is say, we like your net zero, that's jolly good, you've got good interim targets, when are you going to start reporting against nature, and probably also against social issues that are interlinked with climate. So that's what I, that's what I think. So it's it's robust ambition and scrutiny and monitoring. Amazing. Far from blah blah blah, indeed. I just especially part of the conversation, of course, is the type of um, energy sources that um, are available to us. Renewable energy sources, of course. 
which do you suppose offers the best solution in terms of meeting the growing demand for sustainable energy? <laughs> well, that, that is a very big question, isn't it? I mean, it partly depends, obviously, what country you're in, because some countries have a lot more sun. Some countries have more opportunity for um, offshore wind, for example, or mm -hmm. um, other sources. Um, some countries, um, for example, Kenya, also Iceland have the most enormous resources for geothermal, others do not. So it does vary a bit, but all countries have some low carbon renewable energy resources. The issue is, is it available at scale, at cost, and how do you get not just private finance, but public finance in to, to accelerate the investments in that. And with that, as I said, you have to remember that you need storage and you need interconnection as well. So it's no good just having the power. Often mm -hmm. I hear about renewable energy projects not being taken forward because they're too expensive. When you actually look into why they're expensive, it's not the renewable energy, it's the batteries, right? Whether it's at building scale, housing scale, large industry scale, it's the storage solution that's still very expensive. Personally, as a climate change expert and as a mum, um, I would quite like some of that money that goes into fossil fuel subsidies to be going into um, massively uh, investing in storage solutions to bring those costs down. Because if we could bring those costs down, then you wouldn't have, renewable energy is, is cheaper, mm. right? Because, because it's there in nature, you don't have to buy the fossil fuel. So, but the problem is if the overall package solution is more expensive, because as I said, you need the interconnections, you need the storage, it, mm -hmm. then that still influences the decision, uh, perhaps in the wrong way. Now, as well as the renewable low carbon, you obviously have other sources, and some of them are very highly debated. I mm -hmm. think it's very clear from the International Energy Agency and from the science that there is no place for thermal coal-fired power or peat-fired power. And that doesn't mean that every power station will be switched off tomorrow, but countries, you know, and it's very sad to hear what you said about Greece, um, because I think it goes against the, the, the pathways that the, that the international experts have told us. Um, but of course, we're also dealing with a very odd situation in the world at the moment with the Ukraine war. So my hope is that if you if we do take a short detour into coal again because we we need to to keep people's businesses going and so on that it's a short blip and we return as quickly as possible to the renewable energy pathway and that brings us to the two big debatable sectors gas and nuclear and of course mm -hmm. in developing countries a lot of discussion about gas is gas a transition fuel um i think gas would have been a great transition fuel if we had got on with it 20 years ago when we already knew all the science because it provides much much cleaner air usually than coal and diesel. So you would have had this you know, massive in improvement in air quality, probably saved thousands of deaths from poor air quality. And in most cases, gas is less carbon, is less greenhouse gas than coal. Not always, but normally. Mm -hmm. And so that would have been a good thing. The, the problem is that we've got no space left up there for that. We need every cubic meter of space in the atmosphere for greenhouse gas emissions from sectors that we don't have a low carbon solution. There's several heavy industries, several types of transport like aviation, international shipping, where we don't yet have the low carbon solution. And while we're working on that, we're obviously still going to be emitting and we need every cubic meter up there to be used for those sectors. So in power generation, pure power generation, where we know what we need to do, we have at scale, at cost, the low carbon solutions, albeit that, as I said, there's a bit of an issue about bringing the cost of storage down. Yes. We basically ought to be throwing every effort we can at that to drop that curve, because the more we drop energy, the more time we give for some of these more challenging sectors. So my personal view is that gas is not a transition fuel except in extremely limited circumstances. And in fact, the EIB itself stopped financing unabated fossil fuel power in uh, 2019. And that was because we decided that we wanted to use our resources for the low carbon future. Even in developing countries that are struggling to work towards SDG 7, we want to focus on the low carbon. So that was the decision we made. Um, nuclear. Nuclear is a very interesting question. And I think there are two camps. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which camp I'm in, but there are two camps. One is it is low carbon, but the risks of using it are so great 
that we can't use it for the low carbon long term solution. And the other is it's low carbon and we're not going to make our climate targets unless we use it. And those mm -hmm. two camps don't have much middle ground. And you see those two views in investors, in uh, stakeholders. You know, if you go on LinkedIn or I mean, sorry, I'm on LinkedIn because I'm old. You guys are all probably on on platforms that my daughter's on. But anyway, you you see those two points of view. Um, at the bank, it is still eligible, but we don't do it very much, except for we have done in the last 10 years, I think, one or two safety investments. But there are some mm -hmm. countries that definitely see that as part of their pathway. Um, and, and as I said, I don't think it's an easy question. No. Both points of view are valid and you know you, you know you could have an interesting discussion but it's very different from gas in that it is low carbon the difficulty is it's very expensive it takes a long time and you have these big risk issues gas on the other hand we have to be clear it's a fossil fuel lng is a fossil fuel we still need them in certain places but we ought to be transitioning away from them with a level of urgency that's almost the same as transitioning away from coal if we're going to meet those falling curves. Let me bring um, Adjums in here because I know you, you, you belong to a specific camp in this, in, this in this conversation. Let's hear your thoughts here. Yes, sure. I definitely belong to the camp that uh, supports nuclear, nuclear energy uh, because uh, let me just uh, briefly tell you, do you know what is the best uh, the safest, statistically safest transportation method. It is indeed aviation. It is most dangerous and the, the most and and the safest at the same time. Because uh, if uh, the field uh, can bring in more danger, it uh, requires more regulations and more and more uh, clear instructions on what to do. The same thing is with the nuclear energy. Uh, from the very beginning of our history, I believe there were like six big nuclear energy accidents that makes it extremely safe. And uh, the, total, uh, the total death toll of direct injuries was like, I believe 20,000 people, including Chernobyl. Uh, so my take on this is that uh, renewable energy is still the safest one uh, just regarding all the risks uh, and uh, it is much more efficient because uh, I can definitely tell about Latvia that Latvia uh, have uh, let me say 165 days of the sun per year it's like approximate but uh, it definitely is not enough for um, supporting the local businesses and local communities with the uh, solar energy, let's say. That's why Latvia uses 56% uh, of renewable energy compared to the uh, fossil fuel, fuel energy and the 40% of this renewable energy comes from, from uh, hydroelectric plant. Uh, we indeed had... Uh, and nuclear uh, a nuclear reactor it was actually uh, much more uh, scientific related but uh, could be used for uh, powering the electrical grid uh, but unfortunately it was disbanded also due to safety regulations and uh, due to um, it being very old since it was built in uh, i believe in late 80s or something in the library in the camp that believes that we won't meet our climate targets unless we use nuclear but it needs to be very well regulated and and with strong safety is that right have i understood yes. yeah yes yeah. definitely yeah. because because each each field that uh, brings in uh, some some source of danger should be regulated and uh, as much danger it brings uh, as much regulations it requires the same stuff as with the aviation. That's why I state it as an example. Thank you very much, Ajams. Before, before we come back to you, Nancy, I just want to speak to Amir quickly. You know, 600 million Africans don't have access to electricity, Amir. 
rural communities are still using polluting harmful fuels for energy. The situation is known. But African countries um, are among the world's richest in sus sustainable energy resources. Why do you think this potential is still untapped, Amir? One of the um, actual reasons that we, we've still, we're still, um, should I say, um, unable to use um, to use it to um, is because of our leaders, because I feel a lot of um, African leaders like um, they they if they if they do the right thing, definitely they lose um, some of their source of income. Like in Nigeria, I feel one of the reasons um, we don't have twenty four hours power supply is because of the is because of the leaders like um they want you to continue buying fuel because a lot of the um lot of them they they are the ones they are the ones importing the fuel into the country so i feel one of the reasons that we've uh, that we still are unable to utilize the potential of the um sustainable and energy resources we have is because the leaders want it uh, want to keep it that way and i i I would I always tell people around that um, that um even when um should I say the Western world comes and try to help us with help us utilize this energy, they would always be they they bring should I say they don't they, they would they wouldn't they wouldn't want that. Thank you, Amir. I think you, what you're alluding to there is that there, the powers that be maybe are not in support of the transition. But before we continue with the conversation, I just want to welcome our um, African expert. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, um, Dr. Yumkela. Just quickly to introduce our, our new panelists, Dr. Kande Yumkela is the founder and CEO of the Energy Nexus Network and the former UN Under Secretary General and Chair of UN Energy. Of course, we are talking about how Europe and Africa can work together to promote renewable energy and counter climate change. Um, to bring you into the conversation, Dr. Mkela, let me just ask you this, this, this um, first question. You've spoken about how the fight against climate change involves addressing energy poverty, of course, but also transforming the way the world produces and uses energy, which is what we've been talking about so far. To someone who doesn't understand what this paradigm shift actually means, because it's not just a change in policy, but also human behavior, what would a transformed sustainable energy production use and production and use system look like? Well, it will vary from geography to geography. Mm -hmm. In our context, specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, it means that we want to ensure there is universal access to energy for all our citizens, mm -hmm. And second, that we can drive industrialization, meaning a significant generation of power, transmission and distribution of power that will drive our economies so that we become industrialized. And so for us, it means therefore in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, that we have to use all, all I underline, all our energy resources, including our abundant renewable energy resources. So, Again, you have to know the numbers. It is clear that right now, for about 600 million without electricity, we're adding another billion Africans in the next 30 years. So you need to plan for 1.6 billion Africans to have access to electricity. Therefore, all resources are needed. We need to industrialize. Our population will more than double by 2050. That has to give everybody cause for concern. Thirdly, we're suffering already from climate change, significantly suffering in Africa from climate change. And it is a fact that for every one degree rise in, in temperature, it will be one and a half degrees in some parts of Africa or double or two degrees rise. So the worst impacts of climate change will affect us. Therefore, the need for building resilience is, it has to be scaled up and done quickly. That includes economic empowerment. Therefore, the whole concept of industrialization of Africa based on uh, uh, um, our, our, our natural endowments and other competitive advantages we can create has to be driven by that uh, uh, energy revolution. 
another aspect is we can be the main drivers of this new low carbon industrialization. Why? We're sitting on most of the critical minerals. You need to provide the battery systems, the smart grids that are needed. We're sitting on over 40% of the world's cobalt. Manganese is also significant here. Lithium, the new, what they call the new white gold. Uh, Zimbabwe has huge deposits. Tanzania just announced. My small country, we didn't know we had lithium, but we've confirmed that we have lithium. So the new white gold, uh, uh, which, which is lithium, we're sitting on huge deposits, not to mention of other, uh, of, of other critical minerals. Platinum group of metals, 70% with us, nickel. So my point being, we can be the producers of the world's batteries, but it means we'll also have the storage systems to exploit our own renewable energy resources. But it is also important to state that in the last 15 years, 40% of the new gas discoveries were in Africa. Those resources are significant for producing power for us. So the uh, gas to power projects, which have low emissions, they will also enable us as we move towards a full renewable energy future. It means our gas can be the pathway, but that gas is also important for other products, for clean cooking solutions. 900 million uh, uh, of us in Africa have no access to clean cooking solutions. That's a problem. It's killing more people. It's making the forest disappear because we're cutting down the trees to satisfy our needs for basic primary energy. So what am I saying? It differs from geography. For, for Europe, it's about decarbonization. That's the driver because they already have energy and they want to move from heavy carbon dependent sources to less carbon de dependent sources and hopefully zero. We have to do that. But we also need to, to, to achieve universal access. So both of us can collaborate because our emissions will not stay in Africa. They'll move. In fact, the International Energy Agency was clear two years ago. Where Africa goes will determine global uh, 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 um, greenhouse gas emissions. When we are 2.5 billion in, 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 in 30 or 35 years, of course, our energy uses will determine how much emissions are coming up. We don't want to be stuck in the past, but we have to meet our needs now. And therefore, use, utilizing all our resources is important. We've had these discussions for a long time. We need to move from pilot projects to scale, for example. If we say, yes, there's a good opportunity for Africa to go renewables, we want to see utility scale renewable power. Hydro plus solar plus wind at utility scale. Big investments, not a $10 million, $20 million project. You know, we need the small ones, but we also need the big ones because we want to industrialize. We want to industrialize to add value to our other natural resources, including these critical minerals that everybody needs. We wanna see Zimbabwe producing batteries, not just shipping off lithium. We want to see Congo, Zambia producing batteries, not just shipping off, ship, shipping off manganese and, and cobalt and other minerals. This is where we should be thinking. It's a joined up thinking with sector coupling, energy mining, energy industrialization, energy agricultural production. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mkela. Nancy, I'm going to come to you. As, as just demonstrated, even though our destinies are shared, the priorities are different between Africa and Europe. There are concerns that a transition without concrete alternatives could adversely affect African economies specifically. How do you achieve a transition that is just, that supports development and reduces dependency? And can Africa and Europe work together on, on this shared goal? I mean, I think the the just angle is incredibly important. And um, I think I agree with everything that uh, we just heard from from the from the pan new panelists and um, uh, delighted to to be on the same panel with him. We might have slightly different views on on gas, but I think I would like to say that gas obviously isn't going to disappear and it's needed in certain sectors for sure. I mean, um, we were just hearing about uh, cooking. In Europe, it's still needed clearly for heating buildings. Um, 
there are sectors where you still need gas. That's absolutely true. And there are opportunities to, to, to do that in a more efficient, low carbon way than, than is being done at the moment. Uh, for example, we still finance combined heat and power, uh, combined cooling and power, which would still meet our um, um, rules on, on even if it's gas fired power, because it's, it's such an, a very efficient way of, of delivering. Um, as I said, the bank has chosen not to do conventional gas fired power since 2019. Um, and that's because we want to focus on the other other things. Um, but for sure, one of the things we have to think about is how can countries actually develop that they, they have every right. And in fact, there are huge opportunities. And that's one of the things I wanted to say in terms of how can Europe and Africa collaborate. One of the big things that's going on in Europe is the whole sustainable finance finance discussion. So it's about greening our industrial systems. And of course, one of the biggest issues is supply chain. So there's a massive opportunity for, for developing countries. Um, as was just said, rather than shipping off minerals and, and, and raw materials to be developing their industries to be able to provide um, the supply chain, the green supply chain, the low carbon supply chain, which is going to be of high value as uh, uh, industries in other parts of the world are also trying to decarbonize. And so, I, and, I, and that's true in agriculture as well, in, in, in terms of also things like, as I said, the importance of nature and thinking about organic farming and, and, and so on. So I think there's a huge opportunity. Um, it, it is an area where I think we can share experience, uh, not only in the industries themselves, but also in the whole sustainable finance um, architecture, because, as we know, I don't know whether you know, there was a very important report called the High Level Expert Group Report for uh, Climate Finance in Low and Middle Income Countries that was launched at the COP. And there they talk very clearly about mobilizing, obviously, international financial resources, but hugely important, mobilizing in-country resources. And, you know, in, in, in many countries, which are perhaps middle income, you have quite sophisticated financial systems. But in the least developed countries, the financial systems are um, at a much um, um, lower level of development at the moment. So another way that we can help drive the, the agenda and help deliver on the SDGs while um, moving along a, a low carbon pathway, and I would absolutely agree that for some countries it's not about decarbonizing, it's about moving along a, a pathway which is low carbon and resilient, um, is to think about how you can bring that greening into the local financial system, so that you and you know, so you have policy levers, you have you know uh, banking, you get everybody kind of pushing in in the same same direction, and and I think that's an area where um, we can have a lot of discussion. So f there are a number of um, um, developing and emerging economies that have joined the international platform on sustainable finance. It's not just a you know a G20 thing. It's a it's definitely a global thing, and it's. I think a way in which each country can work out how it wants to mobilize the financial resources for its sustainable pathway. So we just add those two aspects, the supply chain opportunities and the sustainable finance um, discussion. Thank you so much, Nancy. Eleni, I'm going to come to you. Um, you know, Nancy just spoke now about how each country needs to have a, a dedicated priority or, or, or strategy rather. You're from Greece, but based in the Netherlands. Um, which of these countries have a, has a climate change or renewable energy program that you, you support or that you're excited about? I know you've identified some flaws, if you will, in the footprint and emissions target system that, that's quite popularized right now. Uh, in general, I would say that obviously the Netherlands are a bit ahead on the more renewable source game than uh, maybe the majority of Europe right now, uh, for better or for worse. Um, there are obviously a lot of issues with a lot of European countries, like the Netherlands, almost failing their own uh, goals in uh, net zero emissions, like two years consecutively, which is obviously problematic. Um, now, uh, on the, is this also included in the role of the state versus the private sector uh, section that we have, or am I just for the... Go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to ask both experts uh, a question that kind of came to me like while listening to both of you, uh, because we're talking about economic empowerment of, uh, I, I dislike the developing uh, term, I'm going to be honest with that, I think it's quite neocolonialist. Um, I, but in general, like African industrialization goes 
directly against the monopoly of the imperial core, like Europe and the Western world in general, doesn't that incentivize like the imperial core to not allow Africa in either way to uh, industrialize or develop in its own uh, way? I mean, we already have the Chinese example where an attempted industrialization was also made with a lot of pushback from the West. So I, I don't know like, to what extent this is realistic or to what extent this is going to go down easy with, you know, Europe and the rest of the Western world. That's uh, kind okay. of my question. I, I, I served as Director General of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and I spent 16 years in that organization. So I can answer that. You, you have a very good point. The geopolitics of industrialization over the last one century is very clear. No other region wants any other country to industrialize faster than they are. Uh, that is true. And so indeed, in, if you look at some of the trade agreements, uh, even between Africa and some of its other partners, it's always about commodities. But of course, Africans have to make that choice. Industrialization does not occur by accident, whether in the newly industrialized Asian countries, as we call them, those in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, or for that matter, uh, the late comers of Malaysia and others, all of them made a deliberate choice for structural change in the economies to shift from commodities to higher value products. It is a choice. No other country will do that for you. You have to develop plans. And yes, there was a time African countries were advised not to do planning, to be more liberal in their approaches to trade and so on. And we became fully commodity dependent. At that same time, Malaysia, for example, stuck to their, their desire and their ambition for agriculture-led industrialization. They developed their agriculture, even using oil palm, for example, from West Africa, and made sure that the, 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 the final target was about industrialization. Korea was the miracle, South Korea. Within 30, 40 years, they had built their industries uh, going forward. It is the same today. We Africans have to make that choice. We're sitting on huge raw materials. It, we've spent 50, 60 years after independence talking about the potential to industrialize. We have to make a choice to industrialize. Yeah. So nobody is going to do it for us. And therefore, we can ride this new green wave. We can lead this new green, in, uh, uh, revo uh, green energy revolution by riding the wave, as they say in South Africa. It's like surfing. You see a wave coming, you ride it to take you to where you want to go. And yes, industrialization has to be part of that. We have to make the determination that in this new dispensation, we can be the component suppliers to the rest of the world to ensure that we all go towards a greener energy future. And I mentioned those minerals we have. But let me also talk about the opportunity, green hydrogen that everybody's talking about. Yes, Europe, for example, is already looking at investing in Namibia, in Mauritania and parts of North Africa, that we can be the lead region in producing green hydrogen because we do have the other renewable energy sources that can help us produce that green hydrogen. But it has to go from pilot projects. Namibia is already right, 2 million people, a lot of space for solar power. They also, by the way, discovered oil and gas now. So my point is Europe also has to have the courage to say, fine, there are bright spots in Africa where we have to go beyond pilot. Namibia, 40 million euros is not going to transform Nigeria's hydrogen potential. Let's be determined. Let's say, let's do something real. And South Africa is hungry. I was just there uh, two weeks ago hungry for energy. Namibia can drive, can provide, can supply South Africa the same way we have the interconnection in Europe. So my, my point is even our friends in Europe have to look at Africa different. We have to look at Africa different to say, look, we have to make bigger investments in some countries and show our readiness to partner with them in higher value products production into new energy spaces, we can also produce components now for, for, for wind technology, for solar technology. But when we still have the, 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 the poverty reduction mentality, sometimes I call it receivership and poverty maintenance knowledge. We do small projects community-based 
that does not transform the whole economy. So it, the dependency continues. There are places, Mauritius, uh, Namibia, I mentioned, Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda, that are ready for bigger projects. The policies are in place. The regulatory frameworks are in place. Capacity is there. The leadership, Kagami is clear. The Kenyans are clear about where they want to go with renewables. Even though they have all the frameworks, we're still talking about potential. We gotta go beyond that. And this is where the competition with other partners that Africans are looking at becomes relevant. There are others that are willing to bet on big projects, big projects, not just pilot projects. We gotta go beyond pilots because the demographic pressures are worrisome. When we are 2 billion, the migration problem will increase in Europe. So that's why I say the urgency and scale and perspective, the mindset has to change. That we need scale, we need speed, and we need stronger partnerships. Thank you, Dr. Mkela. Nancy, I'm gonna bring you in. Um, we're gonna close off soon, but I just wanna um, give you a chance to, to react to Eleni's question and then um, get a, a few questions from Amir as well. Final questions from Amir as well. Nancy, go ahead. Well, first of all, I, I mean, you are entitled to your view, but developing countries is, is wording that's in the Paris Agreement. So, I mean, I use it because that's the words that the countries have negotiated. But, you, you know, I, I see what you say, and I think it's a very good and important point to think about when we use it and why we're using it. I, I absolutely, I mean, it sounds like... Um, the, the, the two, uh, the, you know, the, the Brit and, and, uh, and the African speakers are kind of like copying one another here a little bit, but um, we are absolutely saying very similar things. And I, and I think that that's already a sign that we, we start to see some very big opportunities for Africa, but also other parts of the world um, to not only uh, develop their own economies in a green and low carbon way, but to feed into, build on this business opportunities for other parts of the world. One of the things that bothers me a little bit about green hydrogen, and I think it's worth thinking about this on some of the other huge potential, is that it has to be done in a way that doesn't undermine the delivery of SDG 7 in the country. So, okay, it's, it's, it's critically important that we don't end up in a situation where, you know, the Northern Hemisphere, if you like, is benefiting from the sunshine in, in countries in Africa, while that country still doesn't actually have enough power, as we were talking at the beginning, to run its own industries uh, and, and its own hospitals and so on, so, and its own transport network. So I think we have to get that balance right, but I agree there's huge potential there. One other thing I think that is an opportunity for countries to in their industrial development along these new pathways is that they are not locked in to what we did in the heavy industry and therefore, not only can they look at the low carbon and more resilient, because as I said at the beginning, I totally agree, needs to be resilient uh, and it needs to be thinking about nature and biodiversity, but it needs to be thinking about circularity. We will not be helping the countries with these uh, massive natural resources if we're not also thinking about the circularity angle, because even though some of these countries have found big deposits of lithium and so on, we don't have an infinite supply. We've always behaved as if the planet has an infinite supply of all the resources we need, and we do, we're going to need to use them more carefully, recycle them um, and reuse them. And I, and I think that that's a potential huge opportunity as well. As um, African countries and other developing countries develop this opportunity to feed in uh, not just raw materials, but actual sort of industrial products, which will give them, of course, a lot more economic uh, benefit. They, they, can, they can choose to do it. And that's a very important point that was just made. They can choose to make this industrial change along a path which takes into account all these points, low carbon, resilient nature and circular economy, which will, I think, mean that they have they have a great opportunity to help drive the pathway in other parts of the world, but build a huge um, um, a, a, a advantage, really, for their for their industries, uh, as this is increasingly looked looked for. The, the last thing I want to say is, as well as the opportunity thing, is I think we also have to think about the electrification of other sectors. And, and so the business of interconnecting and energy efficiency is incredibly important because we will not be able to build enough renewable energy to run all the new industries on electricity that need to transform from 
running on fossil fuel. But one of the great potential things, I was in India last week for the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. And of course, India has a, a, a big car industry, but I was talking with people there about the, you know, the really big thing that's coming there is electric mopeds and motorbikes because mm -hmm. um, and bicycles. And I think, yeah. again, I mean, I, I'm, my family are, are, are from South Africa, my husband's family, not mine. I'm from London. But I see huge potential there. You know, every yeah. house in South Africa has got hot water heating on the roof. But nearly everybody's cars are still conventional fossil fuel cars. So I think there's a huge opportunity for, for in Africa for starting to make that leap, which would deliver a supply of electric and hybrid vehicles in Africa, as well as potentially elsewhere. And I'll stop there. But very interesting discussion. I fully agree with you on that, on that Africa should be striving on, 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 on the e-mobility side. I fully agree, especially we start immediately with the two and three wheelers, but other countries also, again, combining that with the production of the batteries, I fully, I fully agree with you. We should think e-mobility quick because, again, we can build that infrastructure uh, 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 even now, especially in countries like Kenya, Nigeria, mm -hmm. Ghana, Namibia, South Africa. They, they, they put, uh, uh, Rwanda already started doing the, uh, by the way, doing the electric motorcycles assembly right there in, in, in Kigali. Very, coming very back good to point. the just point, actually, once you bring the cost down, of the vehicles, whether they're two, three or four wheels, they are much cheaper to run. They are much cheaper to run and maintain. So actually, the, you've got to bring the cost down and you've got to think about vehicles that are appropriate for the, for the less well-off countries and the less well-off parts of society. But once you've actually brought that down, it will actually be cheaper than filling them up at a petrol station. And that will help with the economic development in the countries, but you've got to bring the cost down um, first. And to do that, you obviously need to be manufacturing uh, in continent and not importing, dare I say it, from Europe. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna bring in, I'm gonna bring Amir in for final questions. Amir, we have our two experts here available. Um, what would you like to, to ask? When, okay. This industrialization we are talking about, because clearly we've seen that um, uh, most of the African leaders um, have they don't they they, they are not thinking about um, industrialization. They, they they have like um they just they want to continue this way so um, they could they could um, continue milking Africa um, African countries. So this industrialization is it going to be privatized or um or is it um, still going to be run by the government because I feel like um African the African leaders they've never they 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 don't want it that way. They they believe in um selling these commodities out instead of um keeping it to themselves and um trying to use it for um the betterment of the people. I'll I'll answer that. Um it has to be private sector led but supported supported by effective targeted industrial policy. Industrial policy means government becomes proactive in creating enabling environments for the private sector to move into higher value products. It would also mean in some cases that yes, some public private partnership models have business models have to be built. As I said, other countries have supported their industry. In fact, in fact, if you look at the United States Inflation Reduction Act, that is a classic case of industrial policy. But remember, it was the same uh, Bretton Woods institutions back in Was the Washington Consensus that was uh, uh, advocating strongly against industrial policy for, for almost 30, 40 years now. But if you look at IRA, there's a lot of funding to support all kinds of industries within this green economy space. That's industrial policy. If you come to Europe, okay, let me continue. United States, agriculture, fully backed by government interventions. By the way, I, 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 I was trained in the land grant system in the United States, and I was teaching at Michigan State, one of the strong agriculture bases, and I, I did my PhD at University of Illinois. You come to Europe, same thing. 
Even in the green industry space, Europe is backing their industries, not only with public policy, but with, with uh, financing as well. Whether it's through EIB, other banks and so on, it is still part of industrial policy. And of course, same in Asia. In, 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 in some, what am I saying? It must be private sector led, but governments have to be proactive in, in, in opening up the space, in building the infrastructure, in establishing industrial estates where there's collective efficiency built in. So things like that. And um, I, I also want to go back to the point I wanted to make uh, from the colleague in London. I fully agree with you. Uh, the whole issue of energy efficiency and also resource efficiency is important. Even if we're sitting on raw materials, if the rest of the world is consuming them in the wrong way, we'll be in trouble. So yes, a point about circular economy is important. But even we Africans, as we do this transition, we can begin to in, 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 um, incorporate some of these other ideas of circular economy into our own new models of industrializing. We, we may not need to industrialize the old way. We can industrialize in a different way, but some of the old policies work. Industrial policy is crucial. And uh, uh, Professor Danny Roderick uh, 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 um, in, in the US has been writing about this for some time, that those who have been decrying industrial policy in fact, I've been applying it more. And now we see it particularly to, to create the technologies and the markets uh, that we need for renewable energy. Industrial policy has played a key role and it has to be the same for Africa, both for industrialization and for the energy transition. Smart public-private partnerships that will drive the private sector and encourage them and incentivize them to even invest more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mkela. Adams, I see you still with us. Any final questions for Nancy? Uh, not anymore. So, okay. Mine just got <laughs> answered. So, just got answered. Okay, Nancy, final thoughts before we close off. Yeah, so many interesting things. Um, I just wanted to come back to the question that Amir asked about. You know, um, why are perhaps some governments seem to be a bit focused still on the on the commodities and and, and not on making the transition. I think obviously you can always discuss about whether there are some you know, influences that are may help making those decisions. But I think it's important to talk about the employment uh, and the just transition issue. A lot of reasons why politicians worry about a change is because of the large number of people employed in the current currently in the industry. And that brings us to just transition, which is not only about coal fired power, but it's also about you know, people working in uh, conventional uh, transport. Um, uh, I was actually told actually by the government of Greece that they were concerned about petrol stations, which are normally SMEs, and that um, these are the lifeblood of the village usually because it's usually the, the only shop as well. And yet, of course, they are part of a world which is going to disappear. So another thing for governments, as well as the industrial policy, or perhaps integrated into the industrial policy, is to be proactive about thinking about where the where the regions and the cities and the jobs are at risk, because that is where you need a government intervention in advance. And if you do that, you not only help avoid that a large number of people and industries will, will, will find themselves without a, a future, but you also um, help avoid some of the pushback that you would get on policies because you haven't thought about people. Um, and, and I mean, you know, we've we've experienced this uh, in, in the UK. You had, you know, South Wales where the coal mines closed and the, the communities had no other activity, right? The whole region was completely devastated. There were some other parts of Europe where they thought about that um, even in the 1960s and 1970s and, and avoided the worst of those impacts. That to me, it can be another reason why politicians are being are slowing down some of the changes. But I think that obviously slowing it down is not the answer, but proactively thinking about how you provide a future livelihood for those people when their industry is going to close down is actually an incredibly important part of, of the discussion. And I'll just stop there, thanks. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. I am convinced we have to have this discussion again because there's so much left and said and so little time. Thank you, Eleni, Nancy, Dr. Umkela, Ajams, Amir, appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's it for today. <laughs>